Check. We were better organized when we actually wrote the book. Some people while while you get the picture. Who is this for crying out? <laughs> there she is. Uh, so welcome to the uh, OpenStack uh, Architecture Design Panel. Uh, I'm going to moderate. I have to keep these guys in line. <laughs> yeah. Uh, So this panel is devoted to uh, OpenStack architectures. So we're, I know a lot of people have been at the, at the uh, Kilo uh, Summit sessions. I know I've been to some of these design sessions. But we're really taking it up to the 50,000 uh, 50, foot level and really talking about architecture. Um, this was actually a passion of mine. Um, I had the idea to write this book uh, about two years ago, I think I suggested it to Anne, and she was like, ah, we'll do the operations guide first. <laughs> so uh, what I'd like to do is, um, oh, yeah, do you want to take over? Yeah, that's your question. <laughs> Thanks for the tip. Okay. Uh, I'd like to go through and do a quick introduction of uh, my our fellow authors, um, and then we're going to, we have some sort of canned questions, and then we're going to open up to the audience to ask questions. So this is your opportunity to get the experts to tell you why your OpenStack is not working. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll start very quickly. My name's Beth Cohen, and I work for Verizon. And uh, I actually am not working on OpenStack right now. Um, but I did uh, architect several of the world's largest OpenStack implementations that actually didn't ever get deployed. <laughs> So my name is Mesh Seidel Casing. I'm an architect for Cisco based out of Jerusalem in Israel. Um, at the moment, most of my focus is on OpenStack and architecture. Hi, I'm Kevin Jackson. I work for Rockspace in the UK. Um, I am an architect in the private cloud team. Uh, I do um, professional services on uh, OpenStack deployments. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Scott Lowe, I work for VMware in the Network and Security Business Unit with a focus on OpenStack and other open source uh, related projects. Hello, my name is Sean Collins. I work for Comcast in the uh, Neutron project. Hi, I do. Okay. Hi, I'm Alex. Um, I work for Rackspace. I'm the information developer, so tech writer in this crew, uh, other than obviously Beth. And I mostly work on Rackspace Private Cloud and uh, I guess 50% OpenStack, 50% RPC. 
Hi, my name is Sebastian Gutierrez. I'm from Red Hat. Um, I am a principal architect um, that specializes in large-scale data systems and parallel file systems and uh, large-scale system architecture. Um, I'm currently, my role is uh, specializing in Ceph and OpenStack integration. Hello, thanks for coming. My name is Vinny Valdez. I also work for Red Hat. I'm a principal enterprise architect focused on OpenStack. Work with uh, large customers and partners, and make sure that we, uh, you know, we architect solutions and um, integrate OpenStack with Ceph and our cloud management platform as well. Hi, I'm Anthony Vega. I'm a network engineer for the Comcast OpenStack Cloud team, uh, based out of the Philadelphia region. Hi, uh, Stephen Gordon, uh, working for Red Hat out of Toronto. I'm a senior technical product manager there, um, focused on OpenStack compute and network function virtualization. Before. One thing just to mention, there's two people which are not here. Uh, one of them is Kevin Chase and Sean Wynn, which Wynn was not able to come to the conference. Nick, 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 Nick Chase and Sean Wynn, sorry. Yeah, thanks, thanks. So the first question I, I have for the panelists is uh, focus a little more on the actual experience of writing this design guide. Uh, and the question is, what did you learn uh, as part of doing this process to kind of work together as a team to write a single guide? What, what, what did you learn? What was surprising about the things you, you learned in that study? Mountain Dew, <laughs> M&Ms, <laughs> and don't eat in the room except when the moderators aren't there. <laughs> and put a double space after a period and I'll come get you in your sleep. I'll kill you. Yeah. I don't care what you think. You were taught in high school. Mm-mm. Not all. Especially after a can of Mountain Dew. You're dead. <laughs> so for me, the thing was um, that we actually got the book out within five days, which was actually a very good document, which nobody, I think anybody actually thought we actually could do. So that's what I learned. Yeah, I was surprised, um, you know, given the fact that usually, you know, writing a book is a quite a long-winded process and it's a very, you know, structured, old way of doing things. To actually have it as a, you know, a five-day sprint is actually quite, I was actually surprised at how much we actually got done. And to actually come away with a, you know, a finished article is, uh, is testament to, to everybody on this, uh, this panel. And very readable without double spacing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was very impressed by a lot of these people here. Um, uh, what they've done in their jobs, the kind of solutions that these guys have architected is just amazing. Um, uh, you know, we really put our heads together and I really hope that some of you out there have read um, at least some of the chapters out there. We were really proud of, of what we did. And I think at the time, uh, at least for me, I wanted to fix so many more things. <laughs> but uh, now we have it uh, upstream, and we welcome, of course, um, any changes by any of you out there. And uh, we have that opportunity to do that now. Uh, one of the key things for me in the whole book sprint process was learning how to divide and conquer uh, an extremely large project in an extremely short period of time. Uh, I think it was pretty well executed. Uh, we broke things down, some things you can do concurrently, some things that you need to do in a more serial fashion. Uh, uh, sorry to the few people who had to choke down the entire book and, and rephrase it uh, at the end. But um, in, in all seriousness, uh, being able to work together as a team and to, to break out each individual section and, and write out the things that you know, the things that you're good at, and then uh, get outside of your comfort zone a little bit and try to proofread and, and uh, read through the sections that maybe weren't your forte was uh, a really interesting part of the process. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely say being a writer alone, and I did a, I had a, cr I have a creative writing background, so I uh, left my degree and started working for Red Hat, and then eventually got into Rackspace. And coming and being a part of this team was extremely terrifying for me. Like my technical knowledge is still developing, and I'm learning every day, and there's so much to try and figure out. And my words of wisdom essentially is 
it doesn't matter if you're not a developer and it doesn't matter if you don't know everything, you never will. And the best experience was having these guys. I mean, I got to especially thank Anthony and Sean here on the first day when I thought I was going to smack my head and crawl onto a table and cry because I knew nothing that they both just sat there and said, no, you, you know how to use cloud. Y you use it every day. I mean, come on, girl, you have a Hotmail account. So, <laughs> like, you know, it was, that was really powerful for me. And everyone came together, especially by day five. We all really collaborated. So that was my big thing. Yeah. I think uh, we were really lucky because uh, Beth, Nick, and a couple others really led the charge from the beginning to actually determine the format of the book from the beginning where we were going to do a topic based. Um, and we had a really nice structure from the get go that we could then fill in the details. There was never any, s there was really no significant changes to the structure after we agreed on that. There was no having to like go back, tear it all up and start from scratch. Um, and I think that really was the reason why we had, a we had, we didn't have to rush at the end of it was that we had a really good structure to begin with that we could then break into our subject uh, matter expertise and then fill in. Yeah, that was, that, that was actually, uh, that's a good point. Uh, you the collaborative decision-making process as to what we were going to focus on really helped kind of dictate the structure that we were going for instead of like, you know, the old school method of writing a book where sending messages via carrier pigeon back and forth, you know, or email or whatever you call it. Uh, it's a much longer process, but we were able to accelerate everything by being in the same room with a bunch of experts. We all decided on which direction to go on, which technologies to focus on, which ones weren't applicable at you know th this time. There, w there was a lot of stuff we left out of the book that we wanted to work in, but we didn't have enough real-world examples to kind of put into the book. But you know, we I think I was really happy to see that everybody was able to kind of like you know make concessions and give up some stuff and w the end the final product was a lot more I guess powerful than than it would have been otherwise so as as someone who has written books and I know a lot of the folks up here have done that uh, I, I would say that if you if you have the opportunity to participate in a book sprint I mean it seems really really daunting and you know, and you heard you know, Kevin say run or don't right but I, and it does seem really really daunting but I would I would really encourage you if you have the opportunity to do it, and I don't know if any more are planned within the community or not, but uh, no. if, no. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the ends here. N none are planned, okay, all right. But uh, when the plans arise for the next one, uh, I, and you have the opportunity, I would strongly encourage you to do it. I think that it's a great opportunity to kind of break out of um, any previous ways of thinking about things, the, the whole process of creating the book collab collaboratively, focusing on content generation up front, and then editing and, and polishing uh, on the backside. It's a different way of looking at content and then the distribution model you know, is very different as well compared to a traditional public publishing uh, model. So it's, it's a really great opportunity to kind of do something different. So if you have the opportunity uh, or, or you wanna help create an opportunity to do that, to generate uh, material that'll be helpful for the community, I, I, would, I would recommend it. it. It seems daunting, but I think it'll be worth it in the end. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention in answer to Ken's question around if you're going to do this, um, something that was mentioned in passing uh, was our ever-present captors or facilitators, um, Faith and Adam from Booksprints.net. I think around day three there, things were probably going to go off the rails if it was just us. I think you need that external facilitation um, to settle some of those disputes and um, ensure that collab collaborative atmosphere continues throughout the entire week. People were going nuts. Oh, hello, microphone. Yeah, I'm sure you all heard me anyway. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit nuts. You know, crrr, crrr. <laughs> crazy stuff. <laughs> I would say the most important thing is to start out with the requirements. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know it's, it's a simple thing, right? But you really can't know what it is you need to do until you understand what use case, what problem you're trying to solve. And one of the interesting things about the way the book is structured is that we have you know, this storage-focused approach or compute-focused approach or whatever, and that really does underlie 
changes that you would make architecturally to a cloud implementation, depending on what it is, what use case it is you're trying to solve. And I think that's, I think that's the most important thing is understanding the problem that you're trying to solve and the challenges that, that are around that problem. And then you can, you can head into an architecture discussion around how best to structure the technologies and the components involved to do that. Yes, and really, just real quick, what it comes down to is business requirements and business objectives. Yeah. That's really what everybody or every, every enterprise is trying to solve. You know, what applications do you use to solve those objectives and, and how are you going to do that? And we had these discussions internally, and Beth might expand on that, but yeah. if you look in the book, you'll see that we actually called it user requirements. And the reason was we, we sort of discussed back and forth that if um, a system admin or an architect or an operator were reading a book and saw the term business objectives, they would probably skip over it, and we didn't want you guys to do that. Yeah, I'll add to that. I think I was the big proponent of the, the u user requirements, business objectives, because um, I actually, in my real life, play roles on both sides. So, you know, I'm the person who takes, you know, goes out and listens to the customers and the sales calls, you know, which are not technical. And then I have to come back to the technical people and explain, oh, well, this is what the customer actually wants to do. Um, and then the next step from that is to say, okay, and how are we actually going to do it? <laughs> and that's what this book does. It says, this is the type of requirements. It's a cookbook in some ways, but it's also a guide um, in the sense that it says, these are the types of things that you need to ask your customers to get that those requirements, and this is how to translate those requirements into an architecture. Yeah, I'd say that when we went and designed the structure of the book, w we debated a lot about whether we wanted to be very prescriptive or more advisory, and we ended up going the advisory role because, in the end, um, you know, to Ken's question, when you're thinking about doing an architecture design for a cloud environment, there's no one perfect solution. You're never going to get everything exactly the way that you, you envision it. Um, what you have to do is figure out what the trade-offs are of, of, of all the different things that you want to accomplish with your environment and then make decisions based on where you actually want that to land. And uh, you know, e each cloud is different. I if, if anyone tells you that they've made 10 of the same exact cloud, they're lying to you or uh, they're not designing it towards their actual use cases. So the intent here is uh, for the book to, to be a sort of a guiding hand to say, well, if you want to accomplish X, here are a couple of the options you can use to get there, and uh, here's a couple of examples. But uh, you know, there's, there's always going to be more research involved for every particular use case because they're all different. How soon would the book become absolute, uh, obsolete? <laughs> well, I think the key thing about the book being obsolete is that now that it's part of the overall um, documentation project, uh, it's kind of on the onus of the community in some aspect to continue to let that evolve, much in the same way we evolve the OpenStack software itself. We are anticipating that having this book uh, and this content available and then and, and being able to be updated and, and patched, if you will, through standard processes and procedures would allow the users, the community, the operators, the developers to make this a living, breathing document and not be obsolete. At least that's that's the idea. Yeah, yeah. and I, th I think the honest answer to the question is uh, before we finished writing it and we knew that going in, um, but the key to the sprint process is really it's five days of getting as much of that content created and then you know there is still that bigger maintenance piece of the puzzle to solve as well to keep that up to date then. And we have the same thing with the operations guide as well, uh, where work has to be done constantly to keep that up to date. And this will be similar. Yeah, but I think there's um, I think I remember having the discussion of because we are actually quite high level. You know, there's there's, an, there's a huge element of it that's obviously not obsolete. We're, we're high enough to actually just keep on going. But of course, there's some very specific features of certain you know that was you know we have the software that was available at the time. Um, they're the bits that would need um, maintaining. But because it's an architecture guide, it's, uh, it has a general principle of being um, 
quite. You know, it's got a long shelf life. Did you guys have any heated debates while you were uh, doing the book yeah. sprint yeah. about uh, the book sprint or about uh, technical stuff? Both. So I'll 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 go ahead and throw mine out there. So, and this kind of touches on one of the questions Ken asked earlier about to anybody who wanted to participate in the future. One of the things that I had to learn through the week was that uh, I am sort of obsessed with automation and efficiency, and uh, the tools we're using were were have a lot of room for improvement. We'll say, <laughs> and. <laughs> Um, you know, I immediately wanted to switch us over to using Git and ASCII doc and a bunch of other stuff. And there's obviously not enough time to do that in that sort of week. And, and I had to let go and I had to say, okay, there are more important things. They're higher priority, you know, content was more important. But um, w we definitely discussed some of those things. Um, I guess we can, we, we, we certainly had some technical debates, but I think in general, you know, if you look at the book, we don't have prescriptive commands for you to enter. So we weren't arguing over <laughs> implementation details. It was it was really more high level discussions and, and how do we want to approach things? What examples do we want to use? Maybe that was more of where we had some of the debates. Well, there was uh, two people that were strong advocates of using Neutron, so we were we were able to make that decision. Uh, three, three, okay. So um, yeah, we were lucky that we had a lot of people where there wasn't much overlap in the subject matter and a lot of the stuff like so for storage, uh, for networking, for Nova, we really had subject matter experts um, in each field. So there wasn't, um, I don't think, as much disagreement when it came down. And also, as others said, um, it wasn't really deep in the weeds for configuration. So we were able to step, as uh, step aside many of the common uh, debates. I think that another part of the debate that we that I actually like I remember oh, that I remember is that uh, deciding which technologies we were going to leave in like we really wanted to work in containers but we didn't have enough examples so we had to kind of leave that out but this that is something that you know we knew that over the next year we were going to have a quite a few more examples and maybe we'll actually be able to put that in at a later time or maybe the community can develop uh, a, a guide uh, around hopefully the community will will develop a chapter based on on uh, containers so those those we had I think that was the biggest one there may have been a couple more there was a few about the structure of the book and like which technologies to were, were more important at which times um, but yeah and when we <laughs> could eat and not uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no there was a, there was actually a fair amount of debate around um, where where the examples would would fit in in which uh, of the categories um, so we, we ended up having a general category, which um, uh, uh, the way I phrase it is it's, it's the Amazon model, which is that you are writing, you're architecting for the 80%, uh, the great unwashed, <laughs> uh, three guys in the garage, as I like to say to my coworkers. Um, <coughs> and um, so a lot of examples ended up being in sort of that giant bucket. Um, but then, w then when we kind of dig a dig down, and we'd kind of say, "Well, they really belong in other places." So I think there was a fair amount of debate around that. So, sorry, Ken, real quick. So one of the things that you'll notice if you read the book uh, is about when it comes down to the technologies that we selected, and uh, it, this is something that we actually did have some debate on because uh, sometimes the options were limited. But we tried to stick to, uh, you know foundation included projects specifically wherever possible and not deviate from you know the, the actual core elements of OpenStack that are you know community driven and part of the project. W we made a couple of diversions s some places because uh, there just weren't any better options but we tried to keep that as limited as possible. I'll also just say real quick that uh, there's nothing like being confined to one area for an entire week for about 10 hours a day that'll force consensus. 12, 12, 14. So I think one of the things that comes up pretty frequently is in terms of um, not just multi-site, but when you're scaling out deployments, there's a couple of different techniques um, available with different levels of support across um, the different projects. And there's actually a design session on this. I'm going to immediately after this. But 
Um, the fact that cells, for example, is a NOVA-only thing um, is a big problem, and regions for most people leave a lot to be desired as well. So that that's still a real challenge for people, I think, selecting which of those techniques to use for their cloud when they're trying to scale up and out. And for me, just to continue what Steve said, is that OpenStack is a living and growing thing. It changes the whole time, specifically every six months. And not necessarily what you're designing for now will be able to um, work or work the same way as you did when you originally designed the architecture. So that's something that you have to completely take into account of how you're going to adapt to that change every six months or every year, depends on how you make your upgrade cycle, but that's something that you also have to take into account is of. There, is there a way or a methodology to design OpenStack in such a way that this is the architecture all the time? So if you really wanted to, and you wanted to build for the 80% model and reduce your feature capacity, then you could potentially architect only to the least common denominator. So you can take into account that there are features that are existing now that have no planned deprecation, that have no discussion in the mailing list or over IRC about whether or not they're going to go away, um, and you can implement with those in mind. Um, that's functional. It'll work for, like we said, 80% of the use cases. If you have something specific in mind and you have actual real user requirements that deviate from that, um, then that goes out the window. But uh, you know, if you really wanted to, you can take the sort of long-term support approach to things and uh, try and run a release that you know has the features you need, uh, none that will be deprecated in, in the near future, at least for the next release cycle or two, and uh, that have at least most of the bugs fixed that you're concerned about. Uh, I'd like to add that um, uh, one of the biggest challenges, and I know it's been a c topic of conversation at several of the summits, is upgrade paths, and I know we did discuss that. Uh, it's not touched on in the book. It's touched on, but it's not really gone into detail. Um, but that's actually something that you really, really have to think hard about, because right now the upgrade paths really vary between the different modules, um, and in some cases, can't be <laughs> upgraded. So. Yeah, I was just going to um, add and just kind of flip that round a little bit, and it goes back to like some of the kind of corridor conversations that are happening about having a like longer release cycle or having like a dev release cycle for OpenStack and a longer term release kind of um, model. I mean, there's nothing saying that you need to upgrade every six months unless you need to. It's just standard IT management now. Um, but yeah. Trying, you know, if the community could come along and actually, you know, try and s slow down this this idea that we need to upgrade every six months would actually help a great deal. Yeah, um, I I just wonder though, you know, from a customer facing perspective, I think I find a lot of the time that demand, um, you know, in the community that you see is driven by the fact that we don't really have that eighty percent of use cases actually covered in the core project at the moment, and that's still something where. You know, even Juno may not meet those needs, Kilo, we'll see, and so on. You know, we're not quite at that tipping point where um, there's enough functionality for that 80% of users that they can sit on a release for a longer time intentionally. I mean, the upgrade issues that Beth mentioned means that some people get stuck there anyway, but. Uh, I'll add on to that. So there's this whole other option out there in that, you know, if, if you're architecting for something, you're usually not writing the code for it in all cases. But that is an option because this is OpenStack and it's open source and anybody can go pull the code, anybody can go uh, suggest changes. So if there's something that you really need to match that 80% use case and it's not available now, write it. I mean, it, it, it's, it's kind of a difficult thing to, to swallow from an architect viewpoint, but that doesn't mean it's not an option for you. It doesn't mean that you can't um, you know, bring the resources together and, and, and make an effective change and it benefits you as well as the rest of the community if you, uh, you know, upstream that code. Or in the very least, file a blueprint, you know, of what your desired features were. So that's actually a good question. What I'd like to start with was uh, our brainstorming session. What, what we did on the, I believe, the first day was we actually, everybody took post-it notes and uh, wrote down use cases that we thought were useful within OpenStack. And then we mapped them onto a board and we categorized them. And that's actually what, how we came out with the different chapters that you see in the book today. Uh, so we can probably go through some of the examples uh, just quickly. But, you know, dev test, very, very simply. We had um, 
my favorite was um, security checking, you know, um, um, password cracking, things like that, which is not necessarily something that we're going to do in public, but, you know, maybe if you want to do internal security audits or, or penetration testing, things like that, that might be something that you could use a, a generic um, general cloud for. Uh, I was just going to say, I think that the 80%, in my mind, the 80% use case is what, from at least from people that I've talked to, is the, the general purpose infrastructure as a service cloud. They don't necessarily have a dedicated use case. They're not necessarily deploying an HPC environment. They're not necessarily deploying what is intended to be a storage cloud for object storage or anything of that nature. Um, they're not necessarily doing NFV or, or something of that nature. They're saying, hey, I need to deploy uh, infrastructure that can meet a variety of you know, workload demands from my internal or external customers. That to me is kind of the 80%. The it's that general purpose cloud that you don't necessarily know exactly what apps are gonna run on it. You have a rough idea. You have a rough idea of the kind of architecture that is best supported uh, and how to address that, but it's not, you're not necessarily designing with that, that sort of that one thing in, in mind. At least that, that's, that's my, my perspective. Okay, so what are the rest of you building? <laughs> Just out of curiosity, I'd, I'd love to know. I mean, feel free to come up to the mic and, and ask us questions about a specific use case. Okay. A little more storage intensive since you can run some database stuff on there. Okay. One of the ways I thought of this is, is it's really a le set of levers that you're that you're adjusting based on your. I mean that's how I think of it in my head, um, based on your use. So for example, a database is going to be a lot of storage, but it's also could be if it's a transactional database could have a heavy CPU or compute focus as well. So, and then uh, another one would be. Um, you know, CPU heavy, you know, CERN probably does mostly CPU heavy, although it probably has a big database <laughs> problem too, so. Uh, my question is, uh, how far you can see uh, for the future of the architecture? I mean, uh, for as a like a user, normal user, I see just the, the com like current version. So how far you can see about the update? I mean, two years, three years, five years. So you're asking about OpenStack itself, not necessarily the the book, right? Is that is that correct? Yeah, the whole the whole the architecture. So I mean, as those who are actually inside. So can you see how it looks like after two years or three well, years? Uh, I mean, I'll defer to some of the others on the panel who may have a little more experience, but I would say that all of us are as much on the inside as any one of you could be just by looking at the specs that are submitted for where the product is going. I mean, that's kind of the nature of the way OpenStack is being developed is that as users and operators and developers, we submit specs to say this is what we think the product should do or shouldn't do, depending on you know what it is you're trying to do. And then all of us can get a feel for what that means to the product and what that means to our implementation and therefore our design of the architecture m moving forward. Scott's got a good point. This is a, an entirely community oriented process and community means participation. Um, there's nothing preventing anyone from coming out and participating in, in any of these designs. Um, if there's something that you think is important to you, jump on the mailing list, jump on IRC, join uh, either the OpenStack operators group or the dev group if you wanna participate in development and uh, ask questions, ask about, you know, if, it, if it's network oriented, right? May maybe you're looking for like DVR or maybe you want more advanced networking features like routing, which is in blueprint and, and being worked on. So you can always get a feel for the future of OpenStack by taking a look at what's uh, currently under development. Go look at the blueprints, go look at the, the general vibe in an IRC channel or check the mailing list for topics that you're interested in. You can probably find uh, pretty good information about not just six months out, but maybe even a year out as well. 
like I was just going to sort of reiterate the same point that like the community, this is one of the biggest communities I've seen. And I'm not, I haven't been in the industry very long, but this is enormous. Like the first project I ever worked on basically, I don't know if any of you remember a product project called Elis, but essentially that died. <laughs> and just one day the mailing list stopped happening. And the amount of people that are contributing to this is phenomenal. Like I've never seen anything like this, uh, you know, creative writing wise as well. And I think that's extremely important to note that this will keep going as long as we keep going and there's still passion for this. And it's clear that the 5,000 people here are passionate about this project. So you've got to sort of look at it that way, I guess. And that's from my writer's perspective, I guess, as well. You know, documentation is a really, really good way to get into this kind of environment and see what's going on and see how things are going and where this is going. Because documentation is important, no matter what some of you may think. You know, like, none of us would be here without the documentation of this book, so. Yeah, um, just to what Anthony was saying, I think no one can honest, honestly give you a, you know, exactly what OpenStack will be in two years roadmap. I think there are areas of contribution where there are, we're getting better at longer running efforts, um, like what the guys have been working on with IPv6, uh, Nova Network to Neutron Parity efforts. Um, just some examples that I can think of off the top of my head where there's both the community understanding and an understanding from the technical community, uh, technical community to back that up um, that these things are important long-term long efforts. And those are areas where you start to see some of those longer range plans where you can get a better feel for what's happening in 12 months, 18 months. Um, but I don't think you can yet get that picture across the board with the speed things are moving. Uh, some, of some of the future is going to be dictated by everybody's use cases. So like our use cases, what we need, if we need high performance you know, systems for our databases, if we need you know, massively scalable data stores to just keep things forever, uh, data epocking, uh, data lakes, you know, all of these things are gonna dictate where we go. And it all depends on what you need. And so when we, when we decide, and like when there's enough need in the community to kind of develop those things, you'll see those changes. And those you see those things solidify and precipitate, right? But um, uh, I, I mean, I think that, you know, ac being active in the community and kind of letting us know either by blueprints is a really important way of getting us to where you need and where we need to be looking and focusing our energy, so. Well, I'll just add uh, to your original question about architecture specifically. Two years is, I mean, that's four major releases out, right? I mean, I don't think we can really design an architecture today um, to something that's going to happen four versions from now. But what you, what, what's nice is that there are vendors, including, obviously I work for Red Hat, so I have to say this, but you know, we will support current versions of right now three years out. So that's, that's something that we can design an architecture and still support you for that, that long. And I'm, I know other vendors have. What I would add to that is that um, what the community has been very good about throughout has always been you know, enforcing that there's some kind of migration path as well. So there's, if something's being pulled out, there's a cycle of deprecation where you know that the next release that'll go, go um, get removed. And it'll also only actually get removed if there's a clear migration path for you to get from what you were on before to that next step. And I think that's the important safety. And as long as that's being enforced um, by the PTLs and the technical committee, I think we're in a good place. Just out, out of curiosity, kind of piqued by your question, how many people in here think that it's um, easy enough or you, that you have the access you need to see where the project is headed via, via blueprints. Just, I mean, right, like, raise your hands, like, I know how to go check it, and I, and I know where the project's going, and I feel comfortable doing that. So not very many people, it looks like. Okay, so that's an area of improvement for those of us who are active in the community to help everyone else who didn't raise their hands figure out how I can go and see what's being worked on and who's working on it and what state it's in and that kind of thing. So, all right, thank you. Uh, but well, conceivably, well. yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, this particular book didn't have that particular um, mandate, but there is actually another book which is published on the. It's not actually printed, but it's um, it's on the OpenStack.org site, and it's basically how to get involved in the community and where the resources are. And and I have to admit that. I'm not real good with Launchpad and Etherpad and GitHub and all that stuff because I'm not a coder. Um, so I find them incredibly boring.
Should I answer that question or is the gentleman's question? Yeah, it's a little bit. Okay, well, um, one of the docs uh, things they did is, is all of the specs that we file as developers are now being published on a, a site. So it's like spec.openstock.org. Yeah, specs.openstock.org. Uh, and that shows you th uh, the pieces of work that people are working on for the current development cycle. Um, I, I yield my time. Being a developer, I'd like a pony. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I think something that would help architecture, like uh, architects all over the place, uh, make better decisions is um, examples ba tied to actual metrics. So, if people have examples of, you know, bandwidth uh, requirements and like how you solve those or, or those kind of uh, specific details uh, that people shared with the community, I think that would help architecturally. As far as like uh, components of OpenStack uh, that would help make better decisions, something along those lines to help record that and, and report that in a more you know, accurate way so that architects can make the right decisions on which hardware to buy, which direction to go with whatever, uh, you know, networking, storage, compute, you know, that's what I think would be Um, I mentioned cells earlier, um, but not necessarily the expansion of cells to, say, Neutron or other projects, but um, a concept like it to enable uh, multi-site or at least larger horizontal scale um, than is possible in a single cell um, and some of the benefits there without needing a second endpoint necessarily. Uh, so the other thing that um, that is really lacking the community in, uh, in the sort of expansion of what Sebastian said is um, we really don't have a whole lot of test metrics or stress tests on these environments. It's very difficult to do stress tests on cloud environments for obvious reasons. Um, or maybe they're not so obvious. Uh, but uh, that's we really need that, that feedback. There's a lot of moving parts in these systems, and changing one element can have sort of cascade effects on other pieces of the environment that you kind of don't find out about until it crashes majorly. Ask AWS about that. Maybe they won't tell you, but it has happened to them. Um, so that's, that's something that would be, would be great if, you know, if you've had catastrophic failures um, and you've done some root cause analysis, contribute back to the community, tell us about it. <laughs> so we won't do it again. Um, so w one of the challenges uh, I see a lot is, um, is not so much picking out how you want OpenStack to look, it's more molding it to get it there. And uh, one, one of the things that I think I'd like to see when it comes to deciding on an architecture and actually getting it functioning is deployment tools. It's, it's right now, outside of you know, DevStack with Vagrant or whatever you want to use to build it, um, building an actual production OpenStack deployment can seem like a pretty daunting task the first time you go at it. And uh, getting all the pieces set up where they belong a and functioning together I I is, it's a learning experience. Uh, so I, I think, it yeah, it still is. So some, some better tools around deployment would be great. Can we turn this uh, question around to the audience? Before we end, 
the, the book is available. You can buy it for $29 from Lulu um, if you want a hard, you know, bedtime reading. So, so or you can download for free. Good um, news and bad you news. Know. We actually <laughs> printed 100 books to give you guys. The bad news is the previous conference took them because they got here early. So I apologize. <laughs> Oh, is that so what happened today? In all seriousness, though, this is up at docs.openstack.org, um, and it is a community project, and it's a rolling living book. So if, if you see things you want from it, go pull it down. If you see things you want changed, go suggest bugs against it or actually file some, some commits. So go take a look, docs.openstack.org. Thank you very much, everybody.